I'm not sure if there are any excellencies, but all of you ex uh, excelling, uh, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, um, I would like to uh, talk to you a little bit more about the Estonia now, as uh, that I have your attention. Uh, this morning you heard uh, uh, you heard a speech from uh, our president. Uh, so he said most of us, and he said already uh, gave you the insider perspective. So I can hardly better him. However, what I want to do then, uh, or I would like to do, is to uh, try to give maybe a little bit different uh, angle to this story or, or illustrate it with some more examples. So, um, Estonia, strategic decisions for success. And uh, um, it's, um, once again, I'd uh, like to point out we have all these nice uh, European Union flags here. And uh, this is because they have supported us uh, doing this. But it is the conference. It is uh, E-Estonia we did without the European Union. We did basically most of these uh, fundamental steps uh, uh, before joining European Union and uh, maybe even despite some of their recommendations. But that is uh, now we are living in harmony and uh, hopefully uh, have the uh, somewhat deserved leadership role in some of these issues at least. So, um, I just, uh, you know already where you came, uh, just to remind you, um, <clears throat> we are a small, cold uh, Nordic country uh, with a population of 1.4 million people, uh, with a territory of 45,000 square kilometer, and uh, <clears throat> we uh, are the member of European Union and NATO as of 2004. And as uh, the president said, we had this uh, independence 2.0 uh, in 1991, uh, uh, when we regained the independence from the USSR. And this year, from uh, January, we adopted the euro. Well, uh, some people say it wasn't a smart move. Uh, it certainly was an expensive move, but uh, we'll see about what it will bring to us. So, um, if we talk about uh, Estonia, and uh, I'll try to do it uh, with some factual basis, uh, um, uh, I have a problem, actually, a little problem with uh, uh, with all these uh, scorecards. Uh, uh, if you look Estonia in IDI index, which is what ITU does, uh, then Estonia is on the 33rd place. Uh, well, uh, in uh, I, I like much more this global competitiveness report uh, of the, uh, Davos, uh, the World uh, Economic Forum. Uh, they have they are looking into different things. Estonia there, however, is not very high uh, up either. It's uh, well, comparatively, it's on um, 26th place. Uh, um, with some individual usages, uh, I'm not sure how far it, uh, you can see, but I mean, if we go to the e-government part, uh, government usage, then we are on the 12th place, uh, ranking the 150 states or so. Um, also, actually, individual usage. So, and that reflects something. I mean, Estonia uh, doesn't have maybe some of the fancy stuff you can find in other countries. Uh, but what you do find here is that people use what we have. And um, unfortunately, it's a little bit too big audience to do this kind of live demos here. Um, so I'm going to talk more and show pictures. But if you want the live demos, you can just cross the hall. On the other side, uh, people will show you how they log in, what kind of information they get, uh, what kind of other things uh, can be done. And I believe this is uh, quite interesting, and, and it is also quite widely used. We'll come to that. I'll show you some pictures. One of the, one of the things, however, Estonia, uh, well, what I do when I go to other countries, I always check uh, what is the overall in, uh, internet penetration rate. In 2011, um, this is also ITU statistics, but well, never mind. Uh, this uh, Estonia had 76%. If you compare it with other 
European countries, uh, well, uh, we are way behind Iceland or Sweden or Denmark uh, or for Finland, that matter. Uh, but we are ahead of, uh, of some other countries. So um, this is where we are. What makes it interesting to me is, and what uh, our president said this morning, uh, remember, he said, uh, especially from the beginning, we were dirt poor when we started. Usually we um, associate uh, ICTs with uh, wealthy societies. It's only the wealthy societies that can afford to buy new technology. Estonia was not wealthy, Estonia still is not wealthy, even if we sort of creep into the category of the uh, wealthy states now. And, um, <coughs> and according to that, I mean, when we uh, compare Estonia uh, having uh, almost the same rate of uh, internet penetration as France or Germany, then if we go on and uh, compare the GDP uh, per capita on the purchasing power standard, then uh, we see that Estonia is much lower, much further behind uh, than, uh, than its place would suggest. So I think Estonia in some ways is a living example of, uh, well, uh, finances matter, but uh, they are not uh, that important. So why Estonia? What is interesting in Estonia? Internet penetration rate, uh, uh, when we break it down by categories, the uh, president said it in this morning also, 98% of young people are using internet uh, intensively. This, I think, is something that actually, with all due respect to the ministers and presidents, uh, they haven't yet realized uh, in the government, or they uh, sort of know it, but they don't uh, react to it. Uh, um, uh, I think there is going to be fundamental change uh, as to how we uh, view the society, state relationships, and, uh, and it's going to happen very soon with these young people. But on the other hand, it's also a testimony that something that President uh, Ildas and uh, Minister Avix have started uh, um, uh, 60, uh, well, 14 years ago, the Tiger Leap program actually has really brought fruits. What we also have in Estonia is uh, what I like to call a fully functional e-government infrastructure, and I'll come to that. We have some seven years of experience uh, providing complex e-services to the population. Uh, we have uh, uh, some of these services widely uh, very, well, very uh, successful, like uh, uh, income tax uh, returns uh, submitted online by 92% of the cases. We have uh, internet-based voting since 2005. We have also then the dark side of cyber riots, well, or cyber war as some say. And we are, well, lots of people don't know about Estonia. I mean, I was just uh, uh, <coughs> in one exhibition in this uh, spring, uh, and people came to E-Estonia stand and said, well, what is your company? What are you selling? And I said, well, actually, um, <coughs> we are just uh, trying to share the experience. We are not selling anything. But everybody knows Skype, not Estonia. So how did we get there? Uh, some things you heard already. Uh, well, the Tiger Leap. Uh, uh, then uh, what I think uh, I find fascinating, and people were t telling about it in this uh, EST, first E-Estonia session, it's, uh, <coughs> it's um, one of the best uh, public-private partnerships that I know of uh, around the world. We trained, uh, starting 2001, 2002, uh, 100,000 people in two years. 100,000 people might not uh, uh, feel like many to, to many of you, uh, but it's one-tenth of adult population uh, of Estonia. To train one-tenth of adult population without using taxpayers' money, I think, is quite remarkable. Uh, I don't think that the business people who did it really did a charity job in this. I think that uh, when they financed it, they had very cold calculations uh, in their head uh, because they could close down the um, bank of, uh, branches, branch offices, etc. So they streamlined, uh, were able to streamline their operations and save the money. And. Uh, <coughs> 
In 2009-2010, we had a similar experience uh, with another time of 100,000 people. Uh, this time, uh, people were more told to uh, how to use uh, this electronic identity, uh, how to sign digitally documents, how to vote digitally, uh, etc. So, uh, <coughs> this here is a map of Estonia. Um, as uh, I said first, Estonia has 45,000 square kilometers, 1.4 million people. It's uh, one of the least populated places in Europe. Um, there are some dots on this uh, map uh, where there are dots that used to be public internet access points. They are still there, but uh, today it's maybe largely irrelevant because uh, you can get to internet from anywhere with uh, 3G. Um, so it's, uh, and, and it doesn't cost that much. I mean, it's, uh, I, my monthly uh, plan with my iPad is uh, 6 euros, I think, unlimited access. So I. That's uh, enough for me. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, at, at one point, when we built up this information uh, society infrastructure, I think this was uh, very important that the government guaranteed and tried to help everybody who uh, showed any interest to get into Internet. Now, <clears throat> If you look at the landmarks, uh, um, I've had those up only from the 2000 on. I mean, we had uh, uh, quite uh, many important decisions before as well, but uh, let's say 2000 we started uh, actually uh, providing e-services. The electronic tax board is, uh, was launched in 2000. Uh, M parking, mobile parking. I, when I came here today, I parked my car with mobile phone. I've been doing this for 11 years. Some countries just discover it now and uh, many haven't uh, done it yet. Well, of course, it's nicer if you don't have to pay for parking, but, well, that doesn't uh, happen here anymore. So, uh, we, in 2003, we launched a, a bus ticket based on ID card. In 2007, we uh, launched a mobile ID that the president was also talking about. In 2008, we launched the e-health system. Um, in 2005, we started with e-voting. 2002, actually, uh, the first official uh, electronic signature was exchanged between uh, the mayor of Tallinn and mayor of Tartu. So it was um, uh, quite a landmark also. In 2007, one of the things that we are quite proud of and uh, use a lot uh, or make use of a lot is uh, e-police was uh, launched. So we have this kind of interesting uh, uh, developments, uh, but before I ca come to that and describe a little bit of them and, uh, and uh, tr we'll try to find some maybe conclusions based on this, uh, let me just uh, um, show you something. I have to address this problem, I'm sorry. Uh, it is a question people, uh, when I talk about this, and I've been doing it uh, since uh, 2001 at least, uh, uh, so it's uh, ten, the last 10 years, people tell, okay, in Estonia, yes, well, maybe you could do these things because you are such a small country that you are, um, uh, you are um, sort of an, in the neighborhood of uh, very highly developed Scandinavian countries, uh, so the knowledge transfer is easy. And that you had a very peculiar history because uh, the <coughs> The previous order had to legitimize it itself. And there is truth in all of these assertions, but uh, we have uh, very good neighbors to the south uh, that are small, that share the same history and all this, uh, Latvia, Lithuania. And if you look uh, back in the history, uh, in 2000, uh, the Estonian internet penetration rate was 29%. In Latvia it was 6%, in Lithuania it was 6%. Okay, today uh, the development equals up. I mean, uh, with, uh, uh, the other countries are catching up, no problem. But why was Estonia so much different initially? I th and that was one of the first questions we actually struggled in the e-governance academy when it was created uh, by the UNDP and, uh, and the Soros Foundation. So um, uh, we actually came up to the idea or conclusions that, uh, um, to put it bluntly, politics matters. The guys like uh, uh, whom you heard this morning, Thomas Ilves, uh, who was a minister of foreign affairs at the time, actually did push these things in the government. Uh, 
So we have political leadership. Politics matters. We try to be cynical today's world. We say, okay, politicians are not that important. Well, they are, and politics is. But also, uh, what is important in politics is that uh, you actually do commit resources to that. The resources Estonia committed were very small because we were a poor country. But there were always resources. We uh, found out later, there was no conscious decision, but we found out that from 1994 to 2004, every year Estonian government spent 1% of the budget uh, on ICT. So that is how we got to where we are. So there are the reasons of success. I'm not going into them at the moment. I'm rather describe you some more of it. Uh, uh, but uh, you can uh, certainly go also to the other rooms uh, again tomorrow to e-Estonia e tutorials. And uh, if you have questions, we are happy to answer in other times. But let me just uh, uh, tell you some words about the e-Estonia as a political project. It's quite interesting. I don't think we initially realized, or politicians realized, that uh, E-Estonia uh, could also provide some political capital and international political capital. Uh, they did uh, a cabinet uh, sitting without uh, papers, paperless office, uh, uh, by just wanting to, to get rid of some of the papers, having uh, to have some um, easy access to the information. And uh, they, uh, they succeeded. Um, and and uh, uh, I mean, this is actual cabinet meeting in 2000 without papers anymore. This is how the room looks now. I mean, it's, um, well, nicer, but uh, the basics are the same. And there are no papers, and ministers can uh, participate in cabinet meetings, and the uh, state hasn't collapsed. In fact, it's very interesting. I remember in 2003, um, was it 2003, when Italy became the, uh, had the presidency of the EU, there was a big conference, a EU conference on uh, e-administration, and all EU ministers were uh, sitting in a podium and talking about the e-government. The Estonian Minister uh, of Economy and Communications was somehow conspicuously missing. And I went to look, where is he uh, from this hall? And uh, he was down in the back, uh, and he was uh, actually on the cabinet sitting. He said, sorry, I have some important political decisions here to make. Uh, I'll come and join these guys later. So, I mean, instead of talking, they were doing. So um, what we did, what they had done, we have created e-government infrastructure. It's sort of to create access, I mean, for the citizens through the uh, uh, public internet access points, look at the world, so to the offices. We connected all local governments and government offices uh, through different programs. We digitalized information. You all have done the same. Uh, but we, what we also did, and we created this formalized ex information exchange, what we call X-Road. Uh, which, by the way, is something like 80% of the cloud, I mean, the definition of cloud. And we created and distributed electronic identity. In all, what we have is a, a sort of a, a society where you can put an E or something in front of anything. And uh, it is, what it means is that everything is connected and connected not over some special channels, but uh, over the internet, just using special protocols uh, for the security reasons. So this is the architecture. You can go to the, again to the next room and uh, talk to people there. They will explain how it functions. What I just want to say is that uh, because of this architecture, because of uh, uh, we can access as a citizens these databases, but also the same, I mean, the officials can access these uh, databases. So it's kind of working. It's working since, well, the first tries were 2002. Actually, it, it became widespread in 2003. Now there are so many services. We don't count them for many years. In Estonia, it is meaningless. Three years ago, we did, uh, for secretaries generals of the different ministries, we did a training in e-governance academy. And uh, uh, in this training, uh, uh, we, well, was it our training or no? It was uh, somebody else who did the training. But anyway, uh, what happened was that uh, uh, for the <coughs> uh, 
we ask the Secretary General, okay, uh, what kind of service would you like to see, e-service? E and they thought out uh, a service, said, uh, said it, okay, we want uh, some addresses connected to something, I don't remember exactly. And then they went to have a little afternoon drink, and somebody was doing the service, and it was up and running in less than an hour. So that is what the e-services gives, this kind of flexibility. Um, so um, how we do it is we have to have these electronic uh, ID cards, as uh, our president was explaining to you. Um, it is not only to have them. I mean, you can purchase something. Uh, the trick is how you distribute it to the population. And then again, the trick is how you get uh, them to use it in an electronic way. Well, we have succeeded pretty well with it. Uh, um, um, I think uh, over half are now using this electronic identity, not just a physical identity on this card. Uh, so instead, <coughs> if I put it in a caricature, uh, in 1990s what we had was people just communicating with uh, officials, officials communicating with their back offices. In uh, 2000s, everybody in the world was talking about one-stop shop approach, so you just went to one official who was communicating with back offices. Well, today, <coughs> and what we did in Estonia, or we had always a dream, <coughs> we had a person directly communicating with back offices, without uh, officials. It doesn't mean that officials disappear. No, they have much more interesting jobs uh, henceforth because uh, they can now actually design policies instead of pushing papers back and forth. So what we have as a uh, sort of result, uh, see electronic registries of company, new company 18 minutes, well who wants to do it in 18 minutes, you want to think about it. Uh, it took me about two hours to create a company for my wife, uh, but well. Um, so uh, uh, you see, the, this is a paper trail. I mean, uh, the people who use paper-based registration, uh, this is uh, what uh, people do it electronically. You see uh, quite convincingly how people are reacting. Um, some things that were, and it's very easily explainable, some things that was taking five days before is taking a rather shorter version today. Uh, the same you can see <coughs> how to buy land in e-Estonia. Again, you see, these services are rather popular. What is also very interesting, uh, um, <coughs> and the uh, president said a little bit about it, is the privacy by design. Uh, the digital case file, of the me medical case file, or digital prescription things are very, very good examples. And I actually re uh, uh, encourage you, we, we are not speaking about uh, e-health uh, in the main uh, programs that much, but there is a sponsored session tomorrow at five, 15 hours who is interested in Allegro, uh, where people are talking a lot about it. Uh, also in the e-citizen uh, section tomorrow in e-Estonia, there is a lot to talk about it. But what does it mean? What do they have? What is there to be learned? It is um, uh, the technology today allows us uh, to give the right to decide about our information uh, to the people themselves, to data subjects. So it's not uh, by the goodness of the heart of the government that uh, uh, our data is protected. No, it is our decisions how much we want to protect it. For example, I'm happy to share my data, so I have uh, uh, left many of these options open, but you can, if you want to be secretive, close your data. So it's much of uh, your decision. And uh, you can also delegate things. What is, uh, I can, for example, give the right to, uh, to take my prescription drugs to my uh, cleaning lady if I'm uh, sort of sick at home and I don't want to go to the drugstore. I just enter the data in, in, uh, uh, over, over internet uh, and, and my cleaning lady can pick up my prescription drugs. So, I mean, there are lots of these kind of things uh, uh, what empowers people uh, what, uh, and uh, it uh, at the end gets me a better service. <coughs> so there are uh, things that you can see the coming of uh, new types of e-government uh, 24-7 government, do-it-yourself government, also mobile government. Uh, uh, it's very interesting also uh, integration of different user roles in the government gateway. 
Um, <clears throat> and at the end, we get uh, see what is uh, this is the e-declaration submitted. In 2000, we started with 9%. Now we have a 92%. What it also shows, however, is that uh, if you embark on this road, it's actually quite long road before you actually can take credit for it. Usually, the political life cycle is four years. So, uh, and this is a process of 10 years. This is uh, one of these kind of complex e-services, parental leave benefit. You get from many different databases, um, <coughs> sorry, information, uh, <coughs> and then um, the government will provide you uh, some income after your child is born. Now, uh, it used to be running around uh, uh, to five different offices, getting six or seven papers, seven documents in real life. Today, it's three minutes uh, um, data input. Now, what is interesting with this and what is interesting about Estonia is that uh, even this kind of killer applications where it's really logical that you would use it, you actually don't see it. This is an uh, uh, introduction of, uh, of this parental leave benefit. We started in 2005. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, guys, uh, who is giving birth? These are young people usually, not old people. So we know young people under 35, everybody is using internet, 98%. So why is it only that one third of them is using electronic systems? We are much more conservative actually than we like to think we are. I mean, we're using internet for uh, reading newspapers, but not necessarily by <coughs> by applying for services. However, I think uh, there are also other lessons, and that's why Estonia is really interesting. You have these lessons. You don't see much of it because uh, if you're just looking from outside world and trying to evaluate how many services there are for Estonians, well, if you don't have ID card, you don't see them because it is all behind the protected wall. That's why we are on the 33rd place on IDI index or something like that. So. <coughs> Um, well, um, basically, I, I, I want to conclude here and uh, maybe to listen to you, uh, your interest. We have a distinguished panel here. These people have all had uh, uh, dealings with Estonia or Estonia. And uh, they, uh, well, they have heard me before, I'm afraid to say, but at least most of them. Um, and uh, we, we get some of their perspective, but I encourage you to uh, also provide the perspective. I'm not going to go into the philosophical details. We heard that uh, in the morning. But basically what I want to say is that uh, we are changing the labels quite a lot. We started in 1990s with information society, then we went to paperless office, online government, e-government, m-government, e-governance. We returned to good governance. I've, I think we have stayed in good governance track. I think it's very good, actually, that we stayed there. Uh, and what we see now in real life is that uh, this good government, this e-governance introduction is going deeper and it's going uh, broader. So uh, uh, this is what is happening. Um, well, uh, um, to conclude, then, we are in the new reality where ICT usage is not a hobby, not a tool, but a major building block of that reality. And the reality has already changed, but our minds have not recognized it yet. And uh, we need to work on these new fundamentals and not just sharpening our knives and swords and uh, thinking about the paper solutions or uh, desiring them back. They are not coming back in this way. Thank you very much. Um, if, you want, if you want to learn about the Estonia, there is, oops, why did it go back? Uh, I wanted to show this. Uh, we, uh, we created a website, um, launched it about uh, two months ago. And uh, uh, there you find a lot of uh, stories about the Estonia, uh, about the descriptions of these different components. What is interesting with the Estonia, really, if I compare with my notes uh, that I've uh, been doing, uh, going from one country to another, uh, Estonia <coughs> is created by private sector. It is, well, it is the government things that are uh, uh, created by the private sector. Government offices are very small. Uh, the uh, e-government office or the state information systems uh, uh, office in the Minister of Economic Affairs, I'm afraid to say you are going to laugh. It's nine people. 
I mean, government in Estonia, in that sense, is uh, acting as a smart purchaser. The solutions down to this e-cabinet solution, they are created by private sector. For a long time, Estonian private sector was looking inside and say, well, they were quite happy with what they were doing, but they weren't really looking out. Now they are um, eagerly here and I think uh, they have something to contribute and uh, uh, if you have a chance to talk to them, I, I think uh, you should take it. And this is something that they sort of help to create this kind of e-Estonia uh, tool where uh, you, you can find a lot of information. So, thanks. <laughs> Now I will uh, give the floor to Yuri Misnikov, um, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, he was one of the guys who started uh, uh, e-governance academy, actually, in 2002 when he was working for the United Nations Development Program. And uh, let me just uh, in <coughs> jump ahead also. And the first chairman of the E-Governance Academy Foundation's board was uh, Jerzy Czelichowski, sitting also at this table. So you have some of the people who have had long history with E-Estonia, some others who have had less, but uh, I think their perspective is interesting in any case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibar. Does it work? Does it? Okay. Thank you very much for your story, and the story is told uh, quite interesting story, and this is we gathered here so that to discuss this story. But let me first uh, tell my story, maybe even three stories. And uh, one of the story was quite uh, happened quite long ago, and that was uh, in probably in 2003 during the summit on the Information Society in Geneva, when uh, there was a stand of newly created Egan's Academy with some initial success stories and uh, my former boss at that time, head of UNDP, uh, Mark Mal Brown, uh, said that uh, after visiting the stand saying, well, if uh, Estonia has not existed, it should probably have to be invented <laughs> because it, it really sounded uh, naturally and well Estonia. But, uh, you know, there is uh, sort of a joke, but in every joke there is a lot of truth. Another story has, been, has happened just today, and I've been sitting having lunch with uh, sort of my good friend, I've uh, been working a lot in the Western Balkans, uh, Nera Narecic, uh, who's driving force uh, behind the uh, Electronic South Eastern Europe Initiative, and she was asking, so what's behind that uh, success of Estonia? Why it so happened? And this is what Ivor has been telling all us. And uh, interesting that our uh, reflected along the same lines, talking about sort of consensus, solidarity, of course, right people at the right time, and even uh, was among themselves, and role of, of political leaders like President Ilves today. So there are, of course, uh, some very concrete and very sort of tangible ingredients in, in, in that success story. But at the same time, of course, uh, everyone is asking their own questions, so whether it's applicable to, to my own country, whether it's, uh, it can be adapted or adopted or can be emulated. And it, that this is a very difficult question. I think that all the sessions will be looking at those issues in more specific ways and in, in more specific areas. What uh, I, I would like to tell simply that uh, my sort of last uh, story for today that I remember reading one of the e government uh, uh, reports issued by the Accenture, and uh, uh, what struck me at that time that uh, uh, all those interviewed leaders, executives, both in business and uh, also in, 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 in government, they were saying that they're very curious what others are doing, what other businesses uh, executives are doing, what other governments are doing. So I think that the, for particularly this area, which is new, innovative, everyone is curious what the neighbors are doing, what other countries are doing, so that to compare, to benchmark, to see what can be done, whether we're moving in the right direction, and so on. So, and this is why we sort of today here, we've, we, we've got uh, five uh, experts, which represent both uh, specific countries, institutions, and even regions, 
uh, who uh, will not be making lengthy presentations as normally we do. There will be no PowerPoint presentation. It will be more talk, and I would like that the audience would be involved and engaged in discussing issues. But before, of course, uh, uh, I would like to introduce those who will reflect on what uh, Ivor has said and uh, maybe what I have been saying to, so that to look at uh, uh, some of the issues which are uh, 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 important for us today. So Ivor introduced Jerzy Celichowski sitting uh, uh, clockwise, if looking, uh, then uh, Jeremy Millard, who represents uh, the Danish uh, Technological Institute, uh, says, if I'm correct, and Jeremy has a vast experience in working and reviewing, developing programs for the European Union, the UN, and specific countries, so he, and then uh, you probably, many of you have attended the exciting talk by Phil Noble, also our good friend, about uh, uh, how things are done in the United States in politics. I think what is important that, uh, that Phil underlined the importance of politics, and this is what Ever has been saying, so politics should not be neglected. Probably it's uh, important significance just growing, so Phil will also provide his insights. Uh, then we have also uh, uh, Majid Laboudi, who from, I understand from Sudan, but he has extensive experience uh, of uh, the Middle East in general, but also in Estonia, independent expert, but uh, he's been working uh, also, f as far as I understand, for HP, so he has sort of technological experience uh, of a major technological company, and we have also uh, Artyom Yermolaev, who is the minister of the uh, Moscow government, and at the same time, he's head of the IT department, in charge effectively of uh, all uh, innovations, which uh, we probably also would like to hear from him and uh, uh, compare how it uh, uh, can be uh, done in terms of knowledge exchange and experiences. So what I would like to do, there, was, there is no order in terms of speaking. I think that you can take your liberty and speak up. Uh, but uh, what I would like you to ask, and also then the audience, so if you can highlight one, two, or three major achievements which have been uh, described by Ivor, and, 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 and just comment on that, whether you, what you believe is most important and can be shared on a wider scale. And also maybe something has been missed by Estonia. So they haven't done, of course they couldn't done everything. So that will be also valuable vice versa to the, uh, uh, to the country itself. So let's just have this talk and uh, I'd like to give the floor to anyone who is the brave. Jeremy? Okay, I'm always brave <coughs> and going first. Um, that means you'll forget what I've said by the time the others have uh, <laughs> talked. Uh, I think I've, what I've heard, to, is it not working? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Now what I've heard today, I think it, it reinforces for me the importance of clever and far-sighted people, actually, and that's clearly the case in Estonia, but also the importance of people who implement it in a clever and smart and far-sighted way as well. It's really down to people. And I, uh, I'm a Brit living in Denmark, so I, I know a little bit, but not enough about both countries. So I apologize to the Danes and the Brits here. <laughs> but uh, I think if I go back to what uh, Ivor was saying about the early uh, stages, I can recognize that both in Denmark and the UK. In Denmark, when I arrived in Denmark in, two th in uh, the 1980s, they had already implemented the world's first telecottages, telecenters. Uh, in, in rural areas, peripheral areas. They had about 13 <coughs> of them. It was to compensate the peripheral areas for not having a motorway. And this was when I, the days of ISDN and everybody was waving their arms around uh, about this new technology. So they got these 13 telecenters. And within 10 years, they, would all, they had all been closed down. But the reason was they were very successful because what they did, they trained particularly companies but also people, showed them what the technology was doing, how to use it, and that they should get hold of this stuff themselves. Um, Denmark's a small country, 13, uh, wasn't, wasn't very many. In the UK, something similar happened, and they went really crazy for this telecottage idea, for training, skills, and access, basically. Those are the three key in the early days. They had over 300 of these telecenters. Um, I'm not actually quite sure how many are left now. Not, not too many, I think. 
Um, so basically, the early focus was very much on access and skills. And I think I saw that in <coughs> Estonia as well. But then, in a sense, I think uh, Denmark and the UK differed because in the in Denmark um, there was good political will and also some coordination, but it was quite decentralised, not just to different parts of the country, but down to the ministries and agencies. But very, very strong and good, flexible coordination with a task force. And that's been very successful. The main focus, I think, has been on implementation and management and coordination and processes. Very successful. Putting policies into practice, but in a flexible way. The UK went a different route. They had very, very strong top-down policies, which were su successful for five years. But then they forgot a little bit about the implementation and the skills and the follow-through on the ground. And then they started to lose uh, their momentum and were perhaps less successful than Denmark has been. For example, they outsourced lots and lots of big IT projects to large uh, IT companies and, and didn't really have a good system for contracting and supervising those contracts and have lost huge amounts of money. Just last week, the big uh, National Health Service backbone was finally closed down, not succeeding many, many years out of uh, behind schedule. Four, four or five times over budget and still hasn't been su successful and that had to close down. So I think the, the, the s lesson for me in that is that uh, you do need good policies and political will but you also need good implementation, good people on the ground in the ministries and the agencies and the regions to implement it, you know, who know what they're doing. Middle management I think is key in this as well. Uh, and, and finally, we see this also in the financial crisis in, uh, now, which is no one seems to have mentioned this very much. <coughs> Maybe it's not important in Estonia, but in, in many countries, the financial crisis is really important in relation to rolling out e-government. In, in Denmark, it has meant that everything is now about saving money, cost-cutting, mm. uh, because the only way you can invest in the technology and the people for e-government is basically to say that it actually brings you benefits on the bottom line, benefits for the government, of course. So there's a strong, very strong move to self-service. Everything must be self-service. Moving citizens uh, away from face-to-face -to -face towards um, uh, online services, away from telephone. Um, so basically moving everybody to the online channel. And it's a similar thing in the UK, of course. So they're both, in, in a sense, coming together there. But, but the, the jury is still out on those developments, I guess. So uh, I think Denmark will probably be more successful than the UK. So those are some of the general lessons, I think. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I recall um, buying foodstuffs from Tesco or Asda in the UK, and mm. you, know, you have to check out yourself, so self-service. Yeah, so that's yeah. probably what government is doing. So I thought, well, if I'm doing that myself, I should be paid by Tesco <coughs> probably, <laughs> not vice versa. So yeah. maybe that the way that the government is doing, everyone will be doing self-service. So anyone next? Yeah. Okay, here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I have Still been coming to Estonia since I guess about 1997, off and on, more off than on of late. But I think there are three things that, to me, are, are the keystones. And I think first is Estonia developed the e-everything out of their own sort of distinctive character. This is an unusual country. I mean, it's got an unusual history. It's got uh, unusual geography. And, and I think there was a sense of independence and a willingness to, f to follow their instincts in doing something new and different and untested, but very much related to their character and who they were. And I, and I think if you look around other places where, where ICTs have really worked, it's, it's because they reflected the character of the country in some way, in, in terms of their history and resources and so on. So I, I think that's first. The second is there has been a long-term consistent vision and, and really smart leadership on this. I mean, I, when I first came here in 97, the Tiger Leap was first beginning. But, you, but they were already talking about stage two and three and four. 
that commitment over time hasn't changed. And, and, and in a political world where we make a new decision every 15 minutes based on a poll, that has been really vital, I think, for this country. They have, they have kept the faith, so to speak, for a long time in a very difficult environment. <clears throat> and, and the third thing, and I, I know I'm going to embarrass people, but there have been people here, like that guy sitting over there who was talking a while ago, and this one here, who have been doing this for God knows how long. Too long, probably. But, but, but they have been the consistent. It hasn't just been the politicians giving lip service. It's been the people on the ground every day um, who, who made the eGovernance Academy happen, who made it work, and who have made it a unique entity in our global e-community. And I think that they are literally the ones responsible for the long-term success. Politicians come and go. Uh, a willpower helps to have it articulated at the top. But it is the on-the-ground level leadership that this country's had, in my opinion, that has been the single fundamental difference uh, over time. So thank you for what y'all did. Thank you. And are doing. Thank you, Phil. So, <laughs> Jerzy, so it's, you would like to speak? Yeah. I would also like to start with a story. <clears throat> Ten years ago, I was a student at the London School of Economics. And I decided to write a dissertation about Estonia, as I found this country interesting. And I wrote to a number of people in Estonia, asking them for an interview. I decided to come and talk to them with their too little written material about the country. <clears throat> and one of them was Thomas Hendrik Ilves, who was the foreign minister then, but who was known for having started the, the Tiger Leap project. And lo and behold, I received promptly response from the ministry. He was ready to meet me, he, to meet a graduate student, just like that. And he, I met him, he was late for a meeting, but he was late for his next meeting because he became so excited talking to me about these issues <clears throat> that he was simply ran over time. Uh, and my experience was that these were <clears throat> all very, very passionate people, very open people. 